Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Welcome back to the waiting room revolution. We are excited to have Lisa Gretzky on today. She is a member of provincial parliament from Windsor West of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, and she's the NDP critic for community and social services and has been an MPP since 2014. So welcome to our podcast, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I would love to start with understanding what made you get into politics in the first place. So so a lot of it was around uh, the education system and seeing how chronically underfunded um, special education was. And, and how uh, our school board in particular, but pretty much every school board across the province was trying to take from one area um, in order to be able to, to supplement the shortfall in the provincial funding, to be able to give um, children with, with special education needs. And that's largely children with uh, intellectual or learning disabilities, but some of that are students that were at the time labeled as gifted, so they would actually excel and needed to be more cha- have more challenges before them uh, to keep them interested. Um, so that was a large portion of it. But the, I think the, the fi- well, no, I don't think I know. <laughs> the, the final kind of straw for me that gave me the push was, um, was uh, when we as a board and several other boards had done it as well, had um, what they called non-bargaining employees. Now they still bargained, but they weren't part of the, the bigger unions. Um, And for decades, for decades, um, there was just an agreement in place through through every agreement, this piece of the agreement carried through where they would get their post retirement benefits. Um, And so uh, all of a sudden, um, one year and it was under a liberal government, um, we, we got a letter from them saying we actually changed the rules a while ago. You're not allowed to be doing that. Um, and if you don't start, stop doing that, we're, there's, you're going to get penalized for it. We're going to start withholding some funding or there'll be other measures taken. And so the, the trustees at the time, uh, we had an opportunity to meet with the MPP who used to hold this seat, uh, the Liberal member who um, was a cabinet minister. And if I'm remembering correctly, I believe she held the same portfolio that I do now. She was the minister of this portfolio. Um, and I had the opportunity to raise that issue with her. And she was just outright, no, you have to stop doing this immediately. And I, and I said, but I just can't reconcile the idea of, um, you know, we have many retirees in their 90s and their 80s and their 70s um, that will either not be able to qualify for benefits based on, on uh, um, existing health conditions or it will be really, really expensive for them and they won't be able to afford it. And so I had asked if we could grandfather them in and say, you know, anybody just let those that are coming up for retirement know that they're going to have to secure benefits before they retire um, when it would be easier and and less costly for them to be able to get those benefits. Um, But anybody that was already retired, can they keep their benefits? And the minister at the time said to me, absolutely not. It's not going to happen. And I got... um, a little upset about that. And I said to her, well, how would you feel if it was your mom we were talking about or your grandfather and somebody did this to them? And she put her hand in my face uh, because I was sitting beside her and she said, that's it. We're done here. Um, We're moving on. Any other questions? And it was at that moment that I decided, okay, I'm going to take a run for your seat so that I can can do this advocacy um, at that level. Mm -hmm. And um, I am one of the lucky ones, and I do say lucky, some take many, many tries, Um, but I was elected the first time, and I was the only MPP in the uh, 41st Parliament to unseat a cabinet minister. Um, And, (laughs) and you know, that's that's no small feat, but it speaks volumes to the work that was going on in in the the writing prior, I think. Um, So that really was the catalyst or the the last straw for me where I where I remembered what my friend said many, many years before that, before I ran to be a trustee, which was, you know, you have to you have to be the boss or you have to you have to be at that table. 
um, to get those answers or to drive that change. And that was the day that I decided I, I wanted to be at that table. I wanted to drive that change. Mm-hmm. I was going to say that I, I, just before Sammy came on, you mentioned uh, that you'd listened to a few episodes. So mm-hmm. the waiting room revolution is about you know helping patients and families who are facing serious illness. I think you mentioned you you've had a listen. What what have you thought so far? I really I really enjoyed it, um, and and uh, you know I. I will be honest, I'm the type when I'm in the car alone, I, I like my music on and I like my music loud. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not generally a podcast person, but I was listening to it in the car. I listened to it at home with the, the headphones in while I was out in the backyard gardening. I've listened to it in the car um, and I really enjoyed it. And I think part of uh, uh, part of the reason why it resonates with me is um, is uh, I've had the, the pleasure uh, the opportunity and the pleasure of becoming friends with uh, Dr. Darren Cargill, who you both know. Um, and we worked together on a, a bill called Dan's Law. Um, and uh, um, it was through having that relationship with him and being able to to text him even or call him, even if it was something personal um, to me um, and, and his outlook on, on the healthcare system, um, specifically palliative care, um, but the healthcare system as a whole, and and that um, that that way of looking at uh, looking at healthcare in general is not a, a, a top down kind of thing or a one sided thing. Um, that it's not just about the physicians, it's not just about the nurses, it's not just about a diagnosis. It's um, or trying to um, you know do pain management. It's so much more than that. He was the one that really got me into thinking about the the caregiver side of things, what a family's role is when it comes to to patient care and health care. Um, and so I think that's why your podcast really kind of sings to me um, is after having uh, meeting Dr. Cargill and having those those conversations and then meeting so many other people, um, whether that's caregivers or residents in congregate care or patients. Um, it's just to have that that different outlook that I think that some people uh, don't see. They they miss that 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 full approach to to healthcare. Um, they only see the one side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we go all over the place here, Lisa. So that's okay. Just, just be nimble, okay? I'm a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> you know. Um, hmm. Because I'm connecting um, the work that we're doing with um, part of your history, let's just say. Um, so Sian and I, uh, with our team, we've been working really hard on this revolution. And uh, the gist of it, as you know, is that you know we're all living in a death-denying society um, from beginning to end, and that includes our health. Uh, healthcare culture as well, right? We are trained to fix and cure things. Um, And so, you know, people are left at the end of a long illness journey, uh, surprised and shocked that um, a decline is expected and that eventually they will pass away from uh, a particular illness. And so we spend a lot of time talking about um, how to train healthcare providers, um, you know, from the earliest points of medical school and nursing school, uh, to be more woke about the fact that uh, 90% of their patients will have a progressive illness that eventually they will pass away from. Um, and we shouldn't pretend like we can cure all of these things. So we're trying to affect change at the level of med students, nursing students, um, before they're um, completely brainwashed, let's just say. But when I hear you speaking about your roles in the past and read a little bit about your bio and the work that you've done, um, you know, in the school board system and for public education, et cetera, et cetera, some people um, talk about a public health approach to our death denying society, where you would peel back and go way upstream to children um, in school, learning about 
the fact that part of the natural life cycle um, is that eventually uh, people do die. Um, what what do you think about that idea? Well, I think that it's, I mean, if you look at different cultures, there are some cultures that, like the one that I grew up in, where where death is a horrible thing. And yes, we acknowledge it's going to happen to everybody, but we fight it every step of the way and try and deny it every step of the way until we're, we're really face to face with it. And there are other cultures that teach, um, I don't know how else to say it, but it's almost beautiful the way that they embrace death as part of life. Um, and they talk about the, the, the journey through life um, and how to embrace um, death and what is beyond death. Um, both for the person that dies and and for the the loved ones that are um, left behind, so to speak. And so I think that there's, I think there is, there does have to be a cultural shift in the way that death is overall viewed. I'm going to, I'm going to give you just um, an example. Um, and I'm going to use Dr. Cargo. You'll probably use him a lot <laughs> in mm-hmm. the stories. Um, the first time I met him, he came to my office with, um, with, with an emergency physician uh, an ED doc. And, um, I said to the both, both of them, I mean, I don't know how you do the jobs that you do. They are so incredibly hard. And I'm not just talking about knowledge. I'm talking about, um, I would think it would be very emotionally challenging, mentally and emotionally challenging. And I said, and I'm just not wired for that. Like I could never do what you want to do. I wanted to be a nurse until someone pointed out to me that you lose patients. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I don't mean you become short tempered. I mean, patients die. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, oh no, no, I can't do that. And then I thought, well, you know what, if I go into labor and delivery, that's great. You've got babies and everybody's happy. And they pointed out that sometimes you lose moms and babies. And I was like, oh no, no, don't want to do that. Um, then I thought I'd be a paramedic. And then someone laughed at me and said, well, if you thought being a nurse was going to be tough. <laughs> right. And so when they came in and I said, you know, both of you have really difficult jobs and like, I just am not, I don't think I'm, I'm wired to be able to do what you do. Um, and Dr. Cargill said to me, it's all in the way you look at it. He says, I can't speak for this doctor here, but I can tell you about my job and my job is a gift. What I get to do is a gift. I get to uh, I get to ensure that um, that journey towards end of life is comfortable for that not only for that individual but for their family as well. Um, I get to make that as joyous or pleasurable of of a journey as possible, and that's a gift um, that's given to me to be able to be part of that um, for them. So he said, it's all how you frame it. It's not just about the fact that somebody has died and that's really sad. Mm-hmm. It's it's about life up until that point. And what does that journey look like up until that point and, and, and that transitioning over? Um, so I think that that, you know, until he had said that, I had never really looked. I was always of the thinking that, you know, this is, it's going to happen to us all, but it's a horrible, terrible, sad thing. Now, I can tell you how that kind of played in, into my life and why that, that thinking needs to kind of permeate the entire um, healthcare system um, and, and the, the delivery of healthcare. Um, I'll give you two, two different scenarios, the personal scenarios. My father was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and the way I remember his passing, uh, he was hospitalized. Um, at one point, um, he was completely out of it. He, he, if he did speak, it was completely incoherent because he was so heavily drugged for pain management. Um, we often didn't know what was going on in his care. Um, we were just told we've done this and we've done that. And we went along for the ride and you didn't question it because these are the healthcare professionals. They know what they're doing and they're going to do the best, um, you know, by your loved one, um, and my dad had no, at the end, he had no idea we were even there with him, had no idea. So although my mom was able to be there with him uh, physically, he had no idea. Um, now, in comparison, my mother-in-law, when she was uh, diagnosed with cancer and it progressed really quickly, um, had made the decision um, to have, uh, because there was so much information, um, because her doctor was so open about what 
you know, different options and what that might look like. Not that that's what it's going to look like, but this is historically what we've seen, a pattern we've seen, and everybody will kind of respond or react differently. Um, but, you know, this is, this is what, you know, I'm presenting this to you and you can decide what you want to do. And she ultimately uh, chose uh, medical assistance in dying. And that was really hard to reconcile, to think that, I mean, to think that we now know the day that she's going to leave us. We know the day, we know the time, and that's it. Um, as opposed to my dad's journey, which was, we have no idea. It was a roller coaster ride and we had no idea. Um, and so we, we, you had to kind of wrap your head around that. Um, but the difference between my, my mother-in-law and my dad was my mother-in-law because we knew and she chose uh, when she was going to pass. Um, we were able to sit and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with her while she was still able to comprehend what we were saying and she was able to respond. And we got to say the things that we wanted to say to her. Um, and that gave her and all of us a sense of peace so that when it was time to pass, it was still sad and you still grieve, but there's no, you don't feel like there's that unfinished business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, um, you know, that's really, again, through the introduction to Dr. Cargo, but then through my own journey um, with my, my dad and my mother-in-law to see the difference it makes when, when, uh, an individual is, is um, given everything, all the information, the good, the bad, the ugly, mm -hmm. um, and left to be able to make a decision. When the families, the caregivers are involved in that, mm -hmm. um, in those conversations, and they have that information as well, um, it's, it is night and day. It is absolutely night and day, whether it's just through an, an illness journey or, or um you know, when someone is at end of life, it really makes a huge difference in, in that, that process. Because the difference wasn't really that one passed from assisted dying and one mm -hmm. died a natural death. Really the difference is, is along the journeys, as you said, both of them had cancer. Uh, one had a team that made sure that they were in the know and the other, your father and your family, his journey was one where you all felt in the dark. And so yes. um, there was no opportunity to say, mm, we better have these conversations with dad or, you know, um, there's things I want to say and do um, that are important before he passes. You, you never had a, a chance, really, because everything was happening so quickly. You weren't given any kind of um, roadmap or warning um, because it is possible when people have non-curable cancer to gauge where they're at in their cancer illness, whether it is the beginning, the middle, the end, or the terminal phase. And it is possible for us as healthcare providers to um, educate and share with patients and families um, when we think they're in their last year, and even when we think they're in their last months or weeks. And so it isn't fair for us to not offer people to have that information and have them waiting and waiting and waiting as if someone is suddenly going to tell them now's the time. So yes. that's the part that I, really has to change. Yep. And and I think you nailed it. Absolutely. It was, it was not the way one uh, died over the other. It was with my father, his, his medical needs were being addressed. Yeah. But the, 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 the mental and emotional needs of my father and us as a family were, were taken out of the equation. Whereas with my mother-in-law, all of those were being met. And so that journey was, was so much, um, easier and so much better. Um, for us. And I know people look at me strange when I, I talk about it, where I say um, my mother's, my mother-in-law's journey. So not necessarily the way she passed, but that, mm -hmm. that process um, that's related to that particular way of passing um, was a gift. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely a gift to the mm -hmm. family. Um, and, and that can be that same 
process yeah. can be applied to to a situation like my father's where yeah. we know he's going to pass. We may not, you know, we may not have known when, yeah. but had but had that same type of process mm-hmm. um, been in place and that thinking have been in place, mm-hmm. um, that journey would have been very different mm-hmm. um, em- emotionally and mentally. Yeah. Um, you know, my father's passing was was traumatic. Mm-hmm. My mother-in-law's passing was was uh, again that that journey was a gift that we were given that that we knew what was was coming and we were able to have those conversations. Um, mm-hmm. And again, that could have hap- applied in my my father's um, case as well. But I think mm-hmm. oftentimes it's and it can change, um, as <laughs> you would know better than I do. But that that you know, in my father's case, that can change. And I know that, that, you know, it's a system that people are working within and it's been historically that way. And, you know, there are numerous patients to see to, um, and, and you really just, in many cases, the, the healthcare professionals just want to make sure that they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but I think that we have to redesign healthcare um, to meet all the needs of the patients mm-hmm. and their families, their caregivers, mm-hmm. um, so that those illness journeys and and when someone passes is a very it's a much different um, experience. You know, we've been teaching um, uh, healthcare providers forever how to do this better, um, and again, this is why we turn to this revolution uh, because, as we said in our podcast, the needle isn't work moving fast enough. Um, and we aren't seeing change fast enough. So, you know, this podcast was actually to help patients and families and caregivers, um, position themselves from the time of a diagnosis with skills and a mindset and questions for the healthcare system. So that if we had enough people in the know and woke from for example, the information in the podcast, that they would naturally leach out of the system a palliative approach without ever labeling it from every doctor and nurse and team that they see along the illness journey. Um, We're trying to change the culture of healthcare by a groundswell of patients and families being different patient and families, more empowered or activated or engaged or feisty or um, insisting. (laughs) And, and hopefully we'll educate the healthcare from this side, but the groundswell is going to happen from people like you. uh, And, and eventually we'll have to change the system and the way healthcare culture um, does a disservice to 90% of us who will pass from a progressive life limiting illness with a known illness pattern to it that we we should we should know about yes yeah and i, I what i what i saw like throughout this pandemic um and through my work with uh with the the caregivers um is that uh oftentimes they're labeled as being difficult um, if they're asking questions or they're challenging information that they're being given. Um, And that needs to change as well. Um, You know, we hear um, from the healthcare system as a whole, this, you know, be informed, make informed decisions, ask Mm -hmm. questions, um, you know, get a second, a third, a fourth opinion if you need Mm -hmm. to. Um, And yet oftentimes, um, what I've heard um, through my work is that when people do that, they're labeled as difficult, mm-hmm. um, and so that needs that needs to be a shift in thinking with the, within the healthcare system as well. That mm-hmm. that um, you can't say on one end you want people to do that and then label them dif- difficult when they're doing that, and when it comes to caregivers specifically, when they're asking those questions, it's because they genuinely care about the well being of their loved one. Um, and they want to have all that information. Um, so I would say to, to the healthcare providers, don't shy away from, from giving all that information, whether that's to your patient or, or to their caregivers, um, 
you know, I think sometimes there's the thinking that they can't handle it mm-hmm. or, or, you know, this is really scary information. Um, and we want them to be comfortable. We don't want to scare them, but it's really important that they have all of that information. Um, and sometimes they don't think to ask. So just offer it to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there, there is that shift that needs to, in thinking that needs to happen. And, and some of that is on us um, mm-hmm. as the public, as those that are accessing the healthcare. Um, um, like I said, with my dad, it's just, we just, you know, the doctors know um, and they're doing everything they can and they're making them comfortable and they're going to tell us whatever it is that we need to know and we just trust them. And so I think some of that is the responsibility um, on us from outside of the healthcare mm-hmm. system who have just, you know, thrown our hands up and said, okay, we trust you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we we need to be part of that solution. Mm-hmm. It's not just about getting the healthcare professionals to shift thinking. It's about getting the general public to shift thinking too. Mm-hmm. Um and and um and to want to be more involved and be more informed mm-hmm. yeah you're totally on our revolution bandwagon for sure so many of the things you're talking about inviting yourself and recognizing the role of caregivers is what we talk about and i think and you and you mentioned about covid and this is i know this is something that you have been working on as well but uh covid disproportionately affected people in long-term care homes and on top of that family caregivers were locked out from seeing them. Uh, And I don't think it's necessarily been resolved a year later. So there was a national movement to try to recognize caregivers as more than a visitor, uh, but instead they should be seen as essential care partners. And I know you led a bill on this, Bill 203, called the More Than a Visitor Act. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about this bill and why you you were so passionate about it? Uh, So... During the, uh, you know, at the height of the pandemic, um, I actually had a constituent reach out whose son has a developmental disability and lives in a group home. And, and you know, when people think group homes, they think lots of people living in, in one space, but he actually is in his own own unit. Um, and, and she, interestingly enough, um, is a developmental support worker for a neighboring agency. Um, and she reached out to me and said, look it, I work for the same agency, but in a neighboring area. Um, and I'm, I'm safe enough to go to work. They, you know, they trust that I know uh, how to, to don and doff PPE and do infection prevention and control and support uh, individuals like my son. Um, and yet they're treating me as though I'm some great danger to my son, to being with my son. And, and um, her son is nonverbal. Um, technology is confusing to him. It can be upsetting to him because of his developmental disability. Um, and so, um, to say that they could, they could talk over zoom, um, was just not an option, uh, to be six feet apart outside, um, was, was really not an option. He's, he's very, he communicates by being hands-on. Um, he couldn't understand. It was upsetting to him that he couldn't be with his mom and and hold her hand or hug her. Um, And this is a story I heard from many families in the similar situation across the province and that many just stopped even the outdoor visits because they, they realized that it was more traumatic for them to be there than to not be there. Um, And they were trying to grapple with this, you know, does my, my child think I've abandoned them now because I'm not going Um, do I go? And then, and, and then they get upset. Um, and so that's how it really started. And then I started to hear from, um, families with loved ones living in long-term care. And it was the same stories I was hearing, you know, mom has dementia. Um, you put a, you know, she can't have a conversation on the phone or if she can, we need someone there to hold the phone. Um, and they don't have the staffing to do that. Uh, if we do window visits, it's confusing to my grandfather and he gets upset or he, he cries and asks why we can't come in, um, to be outside and not be near each other. Um, for someone who has hearing loss, um, to try and understand what someone six feet away from them wearing a mask is saying is for some, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so 
I started to it kind of grew once the word got out that I was talking to a few people, it started to grow. And I was hearing from people across the province about um, these barriers that they were facing. And I heard from some of the the residents in, in long-term care as well. And um, so I started, you know, kind of putting all those pieces together and I reached out um, to some healthcare providers, um, to researchers, to caregivers, um, and, and together with them. And the other important piece is with the staff within these different congregate care settings, um, nurses in hospitals, I mean, a hospital is a congregate care setting. Mm-hmm. Um, those within the justice system, I was hearing from, from, um, from, uh, uh, families of youth in care, Um, what it meant to not have that connection with their child um, because the purpose of, of uh, really the mandate is to, is to bring those families back together. Um, But, but going for months without having access to each other makes that process a lot more difficult. And so um, I took all of those voices and all those conversations that I had and brought um, a bunch of people to the table, and that's how we we drafted Bill Two Hundred Three, the More Than a Visitor Act, because mm-hmm. um, I think it's really important to recognize that that just because somebody lives in a group home, or because um, someone lives in a long term care home, or because somebody um, has to be admitted to hospital, does not mean that their human rights go away. Yeah, it's so true. We heard stories like what you described all over the country, and. Um... Just because they're frailer or require complex medical assistance, they shouldn't be seen as less than human or suddenly have no say in their care. Um, That doesn't mean they've relinquished all say um, or autonomy. So um, that's really what came out of those conversations. And that's what the purpose of the bill is, is to recognize that it's, and this is really important piece to point out, is it's not about the rights of the caregivers. It's about the rights of the individuals um, that are living in those congregate care settings. It's about their rights um, and and, um, them having access to their essential caregivers, um, that they have the right to say, I want to have access to that individual, or I don't want that individual to have access to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And what we found is even people who had uh, guardianship or powers of power of attorney we're getting completely cut out of any of the um, decision making. Um, so the residents weren't being um, included in decisions being made about them. Um, but the individuals that had power of attorney or guardianship um, were not being included in decisions that were being made either. And in some cases, those were really, uh, aside from the access issue, they were very serious. Um, decisions that were being made around um, health care, mm-hmm. around medications or, you know, things like that. Um, and no government has the right to unilaterally remove someone's human rights. They don't have the right to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the purpose of the bill is to, to lay out um, in legislation, to reinforce that in legislation. Um, that individuals do not sign away their human rights just because they live in a group home or a long-term care home or are admitted to hospital, um, that they still have autonomy, um, that they have partners in that decision-making, partners that they choose, um, whether that is through legal means or whether that is through, uh, you know, kind of natural selection, family members or, or neighbors or friends that are naturally close to them and have provided care for them. Um, and that when you're making decisions like those that were being made um, during the pandemic, and, and you are right, CN, they are still in place. There are still many individuals that do not have, um, not only do they not have access to their caregivers, but we, we go that step further that it can't just be access. It has to be meaningful mm-hmm. access. So what that means to one individual may be different to someone else. Um, so that's still happening. And, and we really need legislation in place that brings all of those voices to the table, mm-hmm. that it's not um, just the folks at the government table or who the government uh, says we should have at the table, 
that it's legislated that you have to have caregiver voices at the table, you have to have health care experts at the table, you have to have um, congregate care residents' voices at the table, long-term care group homes, um, those kind of things. They all have to have a say in 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 designing um, this this plan um, so that should we ever, hopefully we never, but should we ever go through something like this again, there is already something in place that says this is how we deal with that, um, that we ensure that there is appropriate um, PPE and enough PPE, that there's training for caregivers, um, that there's enough staffing, um, that staffing levels are addressed, that all of those pieces are in place mm -hmm. so that we're not scrambling to, to try and um, put something together or we're being, so we're not being reactive. We've been proactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My follow-up to that is just, I mean, this sounds like, like, what is the status of this bill? Or is where, where are we at with the, uh, I'm making this law because this sounds like it's a no brainer and it should absolutely happen. And it should actually be something that's being discussed nationally, not just provincially. But what I will say is it has made a difference even though the bill hasn't passed yet. And we're gonna keep pushing for it to happen. Even when this pandemic is over, we need that in place in order to ensure, as I said, that if we ever go through something like this again, there's already legislation and a plan in place um, or a strategy as we were calling it. Um, but it has driven change um, because the government did start to loosen the restrictions on, on visitor access. And it's not nearly good enough, um, but they did start doing that. And, and, and I know through my experience uh, in the legislature that the only reason that happened is because of, of um, the bill being tabled and the conversations that that sparked um, mm -hmm. and the attention that it got. Um, we, I had um, a parliamentarian from Scotland who took up the cause in Scotland um, and had tabled something similar, uh, very similar um, to the legislation that I had tabled here in Ontario. Um, England, I spoke to parliamentarians in England and it was the same situation there. And they have eased their restrictions a lot more than we have here. Um, but that led to the easing of restrictions even in England. Um, I had a le legislator in um, Michigan reach out to me about um, the bill as well. So it has had a ripple effect um, around the world. Um, and so it's really unfortunate that it was tabled here and we weren't the leaders in actually passing it and making it legislation. Um, but it's really important for the people that were involved in, in drafting that bill, because I don't take, I, I mean, I'm the, the legislative means um, mm -hmm. to, to getting it to where it was, but it was really um a group effort. Um, it was a grassroots effort to draft the bill. Um, and I largely handed over that over to other people, um, worked with a lot of groups. So uh, disability rights groups, um, um, those that uh, are advocates for, for elder care, uh, for seniors, healthcare, uh, lawyers were involved from the outside as well, you know, giving language and trying to pull all of these pieces together so that they all work together um, because they're such fragmented sectors. Um, they generally don't tie together or work together. So trying to make sure we had legislation that reflected the needs of all of those different sectors. Um, so it really was a group effort. And without that, um, we wouldn't have seen the easing of restrictions. We wouldn't be where we are today as far as, as visitor restrictions. And it certainly would not have driven change in other in other countries around the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean eh, what amazing work and thank you so much for that lisa it i mean clearly has shone a light on the important role that uh, family uh, or the person's you know community of choice plays uh in their well-being and health care um you know, in these settings, uh, and also in the home setting, uh, which is where I practice. Um, so we, you know, so much of the care rests on the shoulders of families, uh, families who don't really know what they've gotten into, who 
serendipitously just happen to be in the proximity and end up the caregivers. We often think that the community, the home setting, is the poor cousins to every other care setting, even more poor than congregate settings. I'm wondering if you've had any chance to advocate for care in the home at all. Yeah, and I I think the important piece around that is recognizing that when you're talking about care in the home, so during my work on on the More Than a Visitor Act, there were a lot of people who who I started with whose whose uh, parent was in long term care, and they withdrew them from long term mm-hmm. care mm-hmm. so that they could still have that um, they could still have that connection and still be involved in mm-hmm. their care. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were some families even with with um, younger kids um, with developmental disabilities who were the same thing. They they mm-hmm. decided to bring their children home. Um, and many at risk of losing their space in that group home or that long-term care home, uh, you know, having to go back on a, a wait list to get back in. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that those, that particular situation, when you are, per, when you are a caregiver at home to someone, um, that is unpaid work, um, that they're undertaking, it is, um, undervalued work that they are undertaking um, and they're often doing it on top of, um, their own work schedules. Um, some are with that sandwich generation where they still have kids at home, mm-hmm. uh, and now they have their, their elderly parent at home. Um, and that's, that's really difficult. And many found, especially in, uh, it happened within healthcare too, but especially within developmental services that once their, their family member was home, um, all of that outside support disappeared Mm -hmm. or was very fragmented Mm -hmm. um, and sporadic. So, you know, while their, their uh, loved one, their mom or dad or whoever was in, when was in that long-term care home, they knew that um, they were going to get support from a doctor, that there would be nurses there, there would be PSWs there to help. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, we could talk about there not being enough of those people Mm -hmm. in long-term care. It's another discussion. But but they knew that there was some care there. Um, But as soon as they brought them home, many of them didn't have home care. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a doctor coming into their home to check on their loved one. They didn't have a nurse coming in to provide that extra support or a PSW. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's, it's, I mean, that was, that showed that um, through the pandemic, it's really shown where that huge gap in mm-hmm. it, or that gap is within um, healthcare mm-hmm. and how um, we need to shore up the support. We need to shore up the home care system. Mm-hmm. And I would argue um, that, uh, and I've met very few people that would <laughs> disagree with me at this point, um, that if we have a really strong home care system, mm-hmm. you would find that, um, that kind of eases the strain on the healthcare system as a whole. You will have fewer people in hospital. You will have fewer people that are living in long-term care mm-hmm. um, because there's that really strong home care system. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, if you are someone who looks at it simply from a, a economic standpoint, a financial standpoint, it's also a less expensive uh, nice. system mm-hmm. than, than the hospital mm-hmm. system itself or even long-term care. So I think we that that's a direction that that um, I believe we need to be going in, and I know that many of my, um, well, not many of all of my NDP colleagues believe that we we need to be um, really building on and strengthening our home care system, mm-hmm. um, and recognizing the work that caregivers do, mm-hmm. um, and and ensuring that there are the supports in in place for them as well, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because when they become tired. Um, when they get run down or they're doing some of these, you know, they're doing lifts on their own, um, you know, or they're trying to, um, wash their loved one or change their loved one. If they're incontinent, um, that can be a physical strain on their body as well. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of the, the mental strain. Um, and, and so we, we need to ensure that, that the, all those we have a strong healthcare system for not only the sake of the individual that needs care, mm-hmm. but for caregivers that are providing it. Yeah. Yeah. They should share the spotlight equally. 
Yes. Both yep. caregiver and patient. Yeah. Yep. And they need they need strong supports. So they're mm-hmm. not breaking down physically or mm-hmm. or it's not becoming too heavy for them mentally or emotionally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lisa, Lisa, thank you so much for spending mm-hmm. some time with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. It was my pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to listen to our first season about the seven keys and to learn more. The podcast is produced and edited by me and Kayla McMillan. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast and help us get the word out.